This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in. Welcome one and all to this newest edition of the VORW International Podcast. Thanks for being here. So I don't know when specifically this program is going to be going out. Um, If I had to guess, late May, early June is uh, my best guess. But again, I can't be 100% certain, but that's just the way it's looking right now. We've got a good show planned for you today. We're going to have some random discussion. We're going to balance it all out with some uh, listener emails as well. So please stay tuned. Hopefully it's just going to be a nice show, and I hope you find it enjoyable. Now, first and foremost, I do want to welcome a few new sponsors and advertisers on board. So what I'm going to do first is we're just going to get these ads played. Just know that these folks are helping keep everything going over here. And uh, then I just want to be transparent for a moment and just talk about why I'm doing that. So uh, please stay tuned. We've got a message from some of our sponsors coming right up. This is VORW. Tired of poor quality fashions that have to be thrown out after just one season? Ecocentric has the high quality, trendy styles you're looking for. Shop their hand picked vintage clothing and upcycled fashion accessories. Browse the wide selection of vintage and pre loved clothing that is much better than stores. Love the way you look and feel, it's the eco friendly choice that makes our world a better place. All eco-centric items are pre-washed and ready to wear as soon as your package arrives. Easy online shopping and fast shipping with great customer service. Visit Ecocentric and save 15% off your choice of items for a limited time only. Use the following coupon code at checkout. Ecocentric15. That's E-C-O... C-E-N-T-R-I-K-15 at checkout. Remember, that's ecocentric.etsy.com, E-C-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-K dot Etsy, E-T-S-Y dot com. That's ecocentric, with a K, dot Etsy dot com. Creators After Dark is an inspirational podcast featuring new and underrated content creators. The show's storytelling format allows the guest to tell their story with minimal interruption. It's perfect for nighttime listening. After VORW, check out Creators After Dark. Are you interested in cryptocurrency? If so, you may be interested in 0x Bitcoin, a fully decentralized ERC-20 token native to the Ethereum blockchain. Using proof-of-work mining, 0x Bitcoin is fairly distributed with no pre-mine, no insta-mine, and no ICO. 0x Bitcoin is designed to be the main medium of exchange and store of value on the Ethereum blockchain. 0x Bitcoin combines the Bitcoin properties of block rewards, proof-of-work issuance, mining reward halvings, and a 21 million coin cap with the Ethereum properties of speed, dApps, and DEX trading. Using the original Bitcoin within the Ethereum network is not possible without using a centralized means, such as wrapped BTC, which exposes users to additional risk. 0x Bitcoin is secured by Ethereum, making it immune to 51% attacks. 0x Bitcoin can be transferred faster and cheaper than the original Bitcoin, and can be used within the Ethereum network without the user giving up control. Look for 0x Bitcoin on Uniswap, and for more information, join the 0x Bitcoin Discord. This ad was paid for by a 0x Bitcoin holder and enthusiast with no affiliation to the 0x Bitcoin developers. So again, those messages were uh, from some of the good folks who uh, are helping out this show. If any of uh, what they do is of interest, just take a look, you know, see what they're all about and go from there. So like I was saying, I want to uh, 
I mean, since we're right there at the subde- subject, I just want to explain why I've kind of reopened the broadcast to uh, ads and all of that. Honestly, if I weren't doing new shortwave airing to Europe, I'm not sure if I really would be doing ads on this program. Uh, for those of you who've been listening to this show long enough, uh, for about the last month or so, I've recently expanded my radio program uh, so that it's reaching listeners in Eastern Europe, Russia, the Middle East, Asia, uh, from a high power transmitter in Austria. Now, I think the results are awesome. The results are excellent, and uh, it's probably the best broadcast I've ever done to Europe. I think I'll talk about it more a little later, but uh, I'm just really, really happy with it. And it's something that I want to keep going, because the amount of feedback that's coming in for it is staggering. Unfortunately, though, the airtime is not cheap. Uh, You've got rates that are near $200 an hour, and uh, that's a huge step from what I normally pay for airtime. So, only way I could even do that is uh, to try to find some extra income, because the YouTube stuff... Number one, that's always variable, month to month. Everything on the Patreon pretty much pays for all of what I already do with the uh, radio side of things. So the money's got to come from somewhere. And uh, I decided, well, I can start trying to do ads on the program. Not going to cover everything, but uh, it's certainly helping a little bit. So that's why I'm doing that, because I don't want this broadcast to Europe to be something that just falls through because I ran out of money. So, I want to keep it going as best I can, for as long as I can. And yeah, if I do that regularly, it's going to wind up being thousands of dollars every year. Right now, though, is it worth it? To me, yes it is. There might be a time where it's not. But at least at this present time, yeah, the cost is justifiable in my book. And like I said, the ads and all of that, it's just something I could do to help keep that going. And that's why, believe me, if you were investing so much into this too, you would be promoting the hell out of it as well, to try to make sure you get completely uh, your money's worth. So, that's what that comes down to. It's just, compared to the other airtime, it's big money for it. And, uh, I just don't want to quit. I don't want to stop doing it. So... That's why I'm doing the ads. If you're interested in advertising on this program, helping keep everything going, you're more than welcome to inquire. V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com If you don't want to advertise, but maybe you just want to help support and uh, help with that airtime, why not? You could always donate via PayPal at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com via paypal or at patreon.com slash the report of the week but yeah the results for that broadcast are uh, are outstanding and it's just so nice to be able to reach listeners all over russia you've got so many people there tuning in and uh it's just great it's just great that it's impacting people over there so i couldn't be happier and uh I'm just very, very thankful that that opportunity presented itself. And like I said, it's an opportunity I refuse to squander. So, I hope you understand why. There's a reason, and, uh, and that's why. And if you want the proof, listen to the broadcast yourself. You sure can. Every Friday is when you can hear it. Every Friday, at the time of 12 p.m. Eastern... So, honestly, you wouldn't really be able to pick it up in North America. But the listeners over in Europe, that's 5 p.m. BST, 6 p.m. Central European Summertime, 7 p.m. Eastern European Summertime, or Moscow Standard Time, 8 p.m. Samara Time, 10 p.m. Alma-Ata Time, and I believe 1 a.m. over in Hong Kong. But, uh... Oh yeah, the the results are just so excellent. You could listen in. The frequency is 9670 kilohertz. So now you know the time and the frequency. 9670 kilohertz. 
That's 9.670 megahertz. But, uh, like I said, the results are just excellent. It's at, it's at a really good time because it's hitting listeners in Russia and Eastern Europe during prime time, but it's still reaching listeners in the rest of Russia and over in Asia at a time where most of the folks there are still awake because it's also a Friday night over there. So, uh... Yeah, it's just, it's just great how it is, and uh, I'm just so happy to be able to do this. But uh, now you know. Now you know why, you know the when, you know the what, who, me. So you know everything there is to know about the broadcast. Please, I extend an open invitation to you. If you want to listen, you have the means to do so. Please tune in. If you're in Europe, you'll definitely be able to hear it. If you're in Russia, you better believe you're going to be able to hear it. It's going to be the clearest airing of my show you're ever going to hear. If you're in Central Asia, let's say you're in Kazakhstan, all of the stands, you'll hear it. If you're somehow in Mongolia, you'll get no problem listening in. And uh, even in Japan, heard from some listeners over there who picked up the broadcast. Uh, but likewise, if you're in South Asia, if you're over in India, and you have a radio, uh, I've been hearing from listeners over there all parts of India, getting a good signal. Uh, honestly, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in anywhere, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, even Afghanistan, uh, you're going to get a good signal too. And uh, I have reason to believe that the broadcast should also be heard across North and possibly Central Africa as well. Uh, maybe as far south as uh, Nigeria. So, if you're in any of those areas, try to listen in. A couple weeks ago, I heard from someone in New Zealand, so uh, even Australia, New Zealand, uh, give it a shot. 9670 kilohertz, it's a worldwide broadcast, and uh, please tune in. It's, it's also great to hear from you, so if you do listen in, uh, feel free to let me know how reception is on your end. I think a little later on, because I actually recorded this broadcast in segments, so a little later on... I think uh, I'll go into this other segment where I talk about shortwave a little bit. So I'm sorry if I kind of, almost with a little bit of redundancy, talk about uh, this broadcast again. But anyway, just letting you all know. Two random subjects I was thinking about. And I don't know. There's no point... There is no rhyme or reason behind it. Actually, three things. This is another little note. Um, since I'm doing the show on YouTube again, uh, if you remember, back when I would do the show on YouTube regularly, it was essentially a tradition. Uh, if any listeners were feeling artistically inclined, you can make a piece of fan art, and then I'll use it in the video, and I'll usually have it as the thumbnail, or just showcase it, uh, on the YouTube version of the podcast. So, a little bit of a uh, open invitation I extend, since the show is back on YouTube, uh, if you're feeling, again, a little bit artistically inclined, and you'd like to make a piece of fan art, could be any style, whatever you want to do, that's the whole point of it, just have fun with it. And, uh, yeah, you want to have a piece of fan art showcased, uh, for many listeners on YouTube, you're welcome to do it. Just make a piece, however you want to do it. And then uh, send it to me via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. You can just send it in as an email attachment, uh, or you could upload it to a third-party image hosting site. Therefrom, I will download it and get it into the video. All I ask, please, is that you let me know how you would like to be credited. Because in the description, I will credit those who submit fan art. If you would like to be credited by name, that's fine. But, if you'd like for me to credit a social media profile, where, say, you have more art, and uh, viewers who'd like to find it can check that out, then let me know what social media profile I'd like to... Uh, or you'd like to be credited by, 
or if you have a website you'd like to be credited uh, by, then you could do that too. But please just let me know how you'd like to be credited, and uh, if, if no information of that nature is sent, then I'll just keep you anonymous. But uh, I just think that's the best way to go about things. You spent the time on the piece. Least I can do is uh, let listeners know where they could find more of your work. So, uh, again, if that's something you're interested in, just reach out to me. And, uh, like I said, there's, uh, there's no fan art right now. So, you make a piece, odds are people are going to see it. It's going to be in the next show that I do. So, happy to bring that back. Um, just a little something there. All right. That word of business aside, because that actually did have a point, obviously. A few, uh, loose thoughts. No rhyme or reason there, too. So don't expect there to be a point, a moral to the story, or anything. Um, there's absolutely no substance here, it's just talk. And I just say that as a preface, because otherwise if you listen to this stuff, probably, you're, you're gonna realize real soon it's just meandering, babbling discourse, and you'd think, well, what's the point? Yeah, that's a good question, there really isn't any. So, I've been on a, uh, you know, because this sort of stuff interests me. I always like the paranormal, unexplained stuff. I do like conspiracy theories, I'll admit, um, but a lot of that stuff these days you just can't really talk about, so I don't. But, you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy that stuff. I listen to a lot of the uh, conspiracy theorist broadcasts on the shortwave and stuff, and uh, my opinion with conspiracy theories is that some hold more water than others. You know, you've got some where it's just entertainment, and it's like, yeah, give me a break, this stuff is so ridiculous, there's no way, it's just entertaining. You get other stuff that maybe is just interesting, but still kind of you're iffy on, and then you have the stuff that you think, damn, this actually makes sense. So... There's a lot of variability, but I just, I've always found this stuff interesting. And, uh, I don't know if this is even a conspiracy theory, I think this is more along the paranormal slash unexplained side of things. But, either way, I'll go through trends where I'll sometimes research this sort of stuff and spend an enormous time uh, focusing on it. And, uh, I go through these phases, you know, right now I'm on a phase where, uh, Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot and Sasquatch is, uh, very interesting to me again. And, uh, before I forget, since it's just on my mind right now, I think this guy actually is a, a listener, so, um... I just want to give a shout-out and a recommendation. Honestly, if you're interested in Bigfoot, I've recommended this before, but honestly, hands down, in my opinion, uh, the best YouTube channel I've ever seen on the matter is a, uh, a guy named Bob Gimlin. That's Bob, B-O-B, Gimlin, G-Y-M-L-A-N. And, uh, I just think, you know... Whether you believe in Bigfoot, or if you don't, or you just find it amusing or entertaining, like I said, either way, I think this guy is hands down the best resource I've ever seen. I like the way he explains things. He really, you know, he dots his I's and crosses his T's, and when he covers things, he does so in such a thorough manner that it makes you think. And he's also got an excellent illustrator who uh, really does a fantastic job complimenting his, uh, his work as well. But I, I just think it's, it's great. When I first saw his channel, I thought, wow, this is, this is something right here. Like I said, whether you 
believe, whether you're impartial or whether you're skeptical. As long as you find it interesting, I think you'll find his stuff interesting, too. Uh, but anyway... You know... I've been going down this rabbit hole for about the last month, I guess. Where, uh... You know, Bigfoot and Sasquatch and all that sort of stuff has been very interesting to me. And, uh... And it makes you think. It, it really does. As for me... I wouldn't say that I'm a skeptic. Would I say that I am a hardcore, uh, confirmed believer? No. But honestly, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of it either. I think if they're around, the population would be small, and, uh, largely confined to remote areas. And I think if they really do exist, I think a lot of accounts would be misidentification. But, uh, you know, you might have the real deal out there, too, in some instances. It just wouldn't be as commonplace as, uh, maybe some perceive. Now, that's just my view, you know? It's like... I'm not gonna say that they don't exist. Because there's some accounts out there... You know, so many of them... Where it's just... You think, okay... I think that this person, they saw something. What? You know, maybe you can't really say. But I just don't think all of these people with experiences are just making stuff up. And when I say that I kind of go down the rabbit hole, I don't just mean reading a thing or two. I mean, I've dedicated in the last month dozens and dozens and dozens of hours to this sort of stuff. And I'll go through it all. I'll watch all the videos. Then I'll just start looking on various forums and groups. I'll go to the uh, Bigfoot Field Research Organization, the BFRO. Open their website. And start going through the written encounters. I'll listen to Bigfoot podcasts. I'll look at discussions that analyze the various evidence etc. And, uh, you know, so when I see that, and I see so many different experiences and encounters, like I said, I've gone through, at a minimum, hundreds, but probably more. Maybe in the low thousands at this point. There's some that are more detailed, more believable, than others. Where, again, I have no doubt in my mind that you know, people saw something. And it gets to a point in certain instances where you start thinking rational explanations don't really make sense here. When I look at the world, I abide by an approach that I think anyway, you know, as a species, humanity has come quite far, but I think it's arrogant to smugly think that we know everything just because there have been great strides in the fields of science, technology, etc. You know, I just never like that attitude where you get some people that feel compelled to debunk everything because they think that they know everything. And I think that's just a, an arrogant attitude, in my opinion. But at the same time, mind you, I go into this stuff with an open mind, but... There's plenty of experiences that I read. I don't just sit there and think, Oh my god, this person saw a Sasquatch. There's experiences that I'll read or listen to that I think, No, I don't think this is real. Or videos that I'll see that I'll think, You know, I don't know. I don't think this is, uh, this is all that, all that much. All, all, all anything really to be, uh, taken note of. There was one instance, you know, that I was listening to, where some people are just a little too out there. It's like... They kind of lose me when they start going into the, the paranormal Bigfoot, or the UFO Bigfoot, or the, uh... the biblical Bigfoot, and all that sort of stuff. You know, you kind of lose me there. You know, I would think that this might just be a, a flesh-and-blood creature, if it were to exist. But, you know, 
I don't know. There's a lot we don't know. But like I was saying, you know, like there's one encounter where someone said, you know, she was driving and saw one cross the street or something. All right, you know, maybe that happened. But then she was going on about how she's convinced that the Bigfoots uh, know that, th that they survey the neighborhood and they know who drives what cars and they keep track of everyone. And I don't know, it kind of lost me there. I thought, I, I think that's a bit of a stretch. I thought, what, what do you have to substantiate that claim? And there's nothing. Just, you know, I think that they do. Well, what makes you think that? I just think that. You know, I, I just don't buy that. But it's like, you know, then you get some encounters where people are in areas where it, it actually could make sense very remote areas of Alaska, northern Canada, and things happen that just, again, don't make sense. And some of these folks, you know, you can just tell as they're kind of, especially in audio form, as they're recounting their experience just by the way that their voices are, and the fact that you can hear the emotion and you could tell in some of these people, that they have full-blown PTSD from whatever happened. Not saying it was a Sasquatch, but they definitely went through something. And that experience definitely traumatized them. Now, some people can refute that by saying, oh, they're just good actors. Eh, be careful with that, you know? You could say that about a lot of things if you want to go that way, and it'll get you in a whole lot of trouble. Depends on the circumstance. But I think some of these folks are totally genuine in that they had some sort of experience that left them all shaken up. That impacted them, scared them, and to them was not something possible. And I believe that they definitely witnessed something. Jury's out on what? But it makes sense in some of these cases, in some of these locations, and like I said, I think given the cultural significance, you'll have folks who will indeed misidentify something, and, you know, they'll think they saw something, but it really wasn't what they thought it was. But you have these other cases, it just doesn't make sense. And, like I said, I'm inclined to believe a number of the witnesses. So, it's interesting stuff. But again, like, you'll get some of these encounters where someone will never lay eyes on anything, and they'll just hear something moving in the woods, and they'll think it's a Sasquatch. Like, I think that's a stretch. Because obviously, in that case, it's a someone with Sasquatch on the brain, and they hear that, and they think, oh my god, that's a Squatch. When really, it's probably just a deer, or even a bear. You know, but again, you have these other things. There was this one guy in rural Alaska, where something was attacking his cabin. And this guy was so shaken up by it, something was definitely going on there. And I, I believe that without a doubt. And that encounter makes much more sense to me than someone, again, who just heard something in the woods and assumed it to be a Bigfoot. You know, so it depends. I go in with an open mind and then I go from there a case-by-case -case basis. You know, I think to myself right now, let's say, because obviously as you can hear, I'm outside, but let's just assume that I saw something, and I had an encounter. People say, well, you got a phone, why won't you film it? But, like, I think, all right, what if... 
all of a sudden, let's say a motion-activated light goes on, and there's this giant creature, this giant bipedal creature, of enormous weight, size, etc. Am I gonna run out there with a phone, even if it records in 4K, and confront this thing? You've got to be out of your mind. Of course not. <laughs> Look, I know this world is what it is, but I don't have a death wish. I don't want to go out there and, uh, possibly get torn up by something like that. You don't know what its intentions are. So no way. At the same time, from the moment I'd see it, I'd be in a state of disbelief, because I'd think, oh my god, it's... it's actually something right here. By the time I'd even be able to lay eyes on it, to the time I get my camera, get everything right, fiddle through it, start recording, already, if it's on the move, I could have lost it. Or maybe I will, maybe I'd be able to get a... a quick video, Odds are, from my vantage point, and I'd only be getting further away, it would be obscured. I wouldn't feel comfortable standing out here and recording, because all I'd have is this little screen to protect me. That wouldn't make a difference. The thing would just move right through it. And, uh, so I would want to go inside. That would, number one, draw attention to myself, but it would also cause me to lose sight of it and it could move in that time. And likewise, I'd have the adrenaline go, and I'd be shaky, you name it. And uh, even if I was able to get something, it would probably be shaky, probably be struggling with the focus, etc. And uh, then even if I were to upload that, all I would ever get would be people saying that it's fake. And, uh, and that would be that. So... That's why I think if I had, if I saw something, would I do a good job documenting it? No, I wouldn't. But that's just me. Sometimes, though, I'll see encounters that just seem like they're too good to be true. And I'll give an example. All right, there was one guy who said... Because sometimes, you know, you say, well, if they really exist, why hasn't anyone shot them? Well, there are encounters, you just have to find them, where people have claimed to have shot them. And, uh, and then you just have to go at your discretion. But there is, like, this one guy... He's probably passed away by now. He, he, he talked about this with the BFRO back in the early 2000s. And already he was elderly at the time, because this encounter happened in the, the 1940s, the early 40s, when he was a teenager. He said he was out hunting, and was trying to track a moose. He shot the moose, and was, you know, following the, the blood trail, but it was through a very, uh, very harsh environment, and he was looking through the brush, and he thought it was the moose that he saw, so he shot it. And at least according to his account, it wasn't a moose, it was a Sasquatch bent over, checking out the trail as well, and uh, he nailed it right in the head, killing it instantly. So then, you know, you can ask the question, all right, so if this guy just killed one, then what happened to the body? Now, according to this guy's account, he said, well, I was only 16 years old. To be honest, I was hunting illegally. I wasn't supposed to be here, but I was just trying to get the meat and, uh, you know, was hoping it was just kind of a no questions asked type of thing. So I was young, I was doing something already that I shouldn't have been doing. I didn't even know what I shot. It really creeped me out, so I wanted to get away from it. 
That was his rationale. He said he just left a body there and got really creeped out. He had no clue what he even shot and was scared to tell anyone about it. And when he finally did, people just made fun of him. That was his answer. You know, believe it if you want or don't, but that's just what this guy claimed. And that the body just decomposed and was just lost to nature. But who knows with this stuff? Honestly, I just find it quite fascinating. It's a really interesting rabbit hole to go down if, if you're interested in it. But, um, you know, it's like, again, you gotta realize with Bigfoot encounters, there are so many of them out there. And the good thing about that, in a way, is that when there's so many, you have so many to choose from. And you're gonna have some that are better than others. And you'll get some that'll make you laugh. Uh, there are some that'll make you think. There are some that are gonna really creep you out. But either way, I just think it's a, a real fun rabbit hole to go down. And, uh, you know, in the end, who knows? Who knows? Population of this planet is certainly increasing, but there's certainly vast areas that are still largely uninhabited or are so sparsely populated, something could probably live there. If it just roams the forest, lives in caves or whatever, you know. Look, you just don't know. You know, for a while the giant squid and everything was... It was not even sufficient proof of its existence until recently, and this is something 50 feet in length. Sasquatch are only talking usually like 6 to 8 feet tall. But like I said, who knows? Theories would then go down to, you know, small population size, relative intelligence and perceptiveness, and, uh, the fact that they're real good at concealment and hiding, again, coupled with a low population size, and that they just reside in remote areas. You have that, which again, to me, if they were to exist, that makes the most sense to me. But then you have people who just kind of go and they say, well, I think that they're, uh, that they're spirits, other people say that they're extraterrestrials. Um, more people than you'd think say that they're the giants, I guess, in the Bible, and uh, that they're biblical creatures. But I honestly think if they were to exist, I think they're just flesh and blood creatures. And that's my opinion. And then honestly, if you want, you know, a good tie-in is uh, the missing 411 stuff. It just makes you think. And then in terms of missing people, there was one encounter, more, more or less a, a missing... It was a missing child. I think it was in the Carolinas, or maybe it was Tennessee. It was somewhere in that area, though. It's just... The circumstances upon which it happened really makes you think. Would a witness in the area said makes you think. And the response from all of these different agencies including military special forces makes you think. And then you could put the pieces together any way you want. No one ever knows what really happened, but it just makes you think. That's all that I could really say. I don't know what to make of it, but it's strange as hell, and it really happened. You know, I don't know. It's just odd stuff like that. And then you just have to interpret it as you do. So that's the uh, first thing that I just wanted to talk about. Just a few loose thoughts thereon. Again, no real premise. No real point. Just something to talk about. 
on uh, one other note, I don't really... This is not going to be as long as the previous thing. I was looking through old videos, and I was just thinking back for some reason to, uh... The times when I would go to the Nathan's hot dog eating qualifier. I don't know what I'm even... I don't know, it was just something I was thinking about. Nothing really to say... ...on the matter. But... I, I don't know. I just don't get the appeal. I guess the same thing then could be said about... ...mukbangs. I just don't understand these acts of gluttony. You know? Look, it is what it is, it's your life, do what you want. As long as you don't hurt other people, but I don't understand the appeal. Doesn't make sense to me. It actually... To be honest, it repulses me. And I react in utter revulsion at any of these things. Food-eating contests, or mukbangs, you don't know how disgusting I think those things are. But like I said, I don't watch them, so I don't care. If you listen to this and you you enjoy them, I don't care. Then enjoy them. If you enjoy doing them, just be responsible. I don't care. That's just what it comes down to. I just don't want a part of it. I don't want to see it. But it's my life and I could control that, you know? Then I don't have to see it. So I won't. But, uh... I don't get the appeal. I don't know. I... I don't get it. I'm kind of like the opposite, you know? When it comes to me... I'm very small. I eat, you know, like once a day. But I take all my vitamins, you know? I stay active. I'm doing alright in that regard. But, you know, I just don't eat a lot. That's why some people say, why do you... Uh, how can you do the fast food reviews? And, uh... Etc, etc, etc. How can you eat all this stuff? Well, the thing you have to remember is that I really don't eat anything. That's why. I try to stay active to a degree, but it's like if I get something to review, like the, the last review with the Mexican pizza that I did, along with the Mexican pizza, I got a crunch wrap with no cheese and no sour cream, but some fire sauce. I threw that Mexican pizza straight in the trash when I shut the camera off, and I ate that crunch wrap. And that was my meal for the next 24 hours. Then, 24 hours later, I had some boneless wings. You know, just a order of boneless wings, and that was my meal. Then 24 hours later, I had, uh, oh, more boneless wings. And then 24 hours later, I had a hamburger and some fries from IHOP. And that's my meal now, and that's all that, you know, that's what I ate for the day. So it's not like I'm getting a dozen tacos, and then the next day I'll get boneless wings and uh, two double cheeseburgers, or, you know, I don't have three giant meals a day, etc. But that's just me. Everyone's needs are different. It's like... Here's the other thing, mind you. I'm a very docile person. So... Does my body need a lot? No, it doesn't. If I were out there... And I kind of scoff at the notion, but let's use this as a theoretical example. If I were out there... Uh, working on a construction site... I would need to eat more. You know, I would have to. I need more energy, need more nutrients. So, it's all circumstantial. But everyone, I'm, I am convinced that everyone's needs and bodies are different. So in my case, I'm alright with this, because it works for me. This is how I've been for years, and it's fine. But there's other, th other folks who I think maybe need the three meals a day, or other folks who need to snack more often. You know, it's an individual thing. You know your body best. I know mine best, and I know that this is what 
works for it, and it's what makes me happy. But everyone's different, so I'm not going to sit there and pretend that just because I'm this way, everyone else can be too. But I just don't get the appeal of the mukbangs, and it just, I don't know, it grosses me out when I think of people eating inordinate amounts of food. But I was thinking about those hot dog qualifiers. You know, that they gross me out, yeah. I kind of think, how do these folks feel after the fact? Like, I don't... I can't even tell you how I would feel if I ate 25 hot dogs or something, or 40 hot dogs. I don't even want to think about it. So I don't understand. You know, I just don't get it. But... Yeah. Some people get it, some people like it. It is what it is. I just think back to the one Nathan's hot dog qualifier in 2016. Now, I went to them, I think in 2015, though I didn't document that one, and I know in 2016 and 2017, because they would be there at the NASCAR race, in Pocono, Pennsylvania. Which, until recently, I made it a tradition to attend, but... Yeah, with the COVID and all that stuff, I just said, ah, forget it. You know, that was in 2020, and then 2021, I just said, ah, I don't know, too many people. And that's the same thing for this year. But, uh... Now, I know for the fact... In 2017, the weather that day was, well, pleasant for hot dog eating. Sunny, warm, you name it. And the hot dogs were cooked fresh. So at least the folks that year were getting fresh hot dogs. So it's one thing, you know, to be eating this innumerable amount of fresh Nathan's hot dogs. All right. Not a chance I would do it. I would eat one hot dog. If I had to do that, I'd say, all right, I'm going to eat one hot dog, and that's it. And if they want to get angry at me or something, I don't care. But I'm not I'm not doing any more. But in 2016, they weren't fresh hot dogs, because I got there early. And that morning, it was cloudy, and it was rainy, too. There was rain coming down, and it was a cold rain. You know, it was, like, in the low 50s, and I think the rain was colder. So that's not, you know, it wasn't, it was a raw day. And it was very dreary. The race got canceled, but I thought, ah, what the heck, I'll watch the hot dog thing anyway. They cooked the hot dogs an hour before the contest began put them on a paper plate, and then sat them out there in the cold rain for an hour. So, now imagine eating 40 cold, soggy hot dogs that are just all soaked up with cold water on this raw day. Yeah, I don't see how that can be a good time at all. I don't get it. I, I just don't understand it. I don't know what else I can say. Anyway, that's all I really wanted to talk about. Uh, next segment I recorded earlier. Again, it's going to seem a little redundant in terms of the radio stuff, but I kind of got sidetracked, and then I went on this really long tangent about international broadcasting, but honestly, yeah, just listen, make of it what you will. This is VORW. Um, the broadcast to Europe, if you would believe it, because I'll tell you a little story. Um, why not? That's the whole point of this show, is to just kind of go on the long-winded anecdotes uh, that I normally wouldn't on YouTube, so forget it. I'm just going to go, I'm going to tell you the whole story and uh, skip ahead if you don't like it. The uh, radio show that I do, I'm not going to explain shortwave or any of that, but I'll just kind of talk about the... I don't know if parameters is the right word or not, but, um... 
well, some of the issues I've faced uh, over the years. I'll explain something about international broadcasting on the shortwave. I'll tell you this right now. It's dying. And I think we all understand that. Um, I don't think very many people look at shortwave radio these days and think that it's something that's uh, better than ever. Many folks, understandably, associate shortwave radio with the Cold War, uh, or even World War II. And uh, indeed, both those times, it was very popular. But obviously, because of the internet and phones, smartphones, streaming audio, etc., uh, you know, the prevalence of shortwave radio has really dropped off. Um, but one misconception is that there are zero people out there who listen to broadcasts on shortwave anymore, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So that's just a misconception. It's dying, but it's not dead. And obviously there's a difference, and we understand that. Dying does not equal dead. Um, but it certainly doesn't equal something that's healthy, either. So, understanding that, one way that I feel about the medium of international broadcasting via shortwave is, uh, it's dying, and every year it's going to be worse than the last in terms of potential audience, size, the amount of people, or broadcasters, I should say, that are still utilizing the medium, etc. So, when I first started my radio show on the shortwave, let's go all the way back to early 2015, because that's actually when I first started my shortwave broadcast. There were more listeners, more shortwave listeners, in the United States in 2015 than there are in 2022. I may be a pessimist, but I truly believe that any efforts I've made in terms of promoting shortwave radio uh, to listeners in the United States still doesn't do enough to negate the year-on-year -year loss uh, of audience, because we're talking... It's just too many people. And I think the main reason for uh, the audience in the United States still continuing to decline, morbid it may be, I just think it's because a lot of the older listeners are dying off at this point. But like I was saying, doesn't mean that it's zero. But I'll, like, I'll give an example of why I feel that it's kind of in decline, and I'll just use my own program as an example. I remember when I first started broadcasting in 2015. You have to understand that back then the YouTube channel wasn't very big at all. I only had a couple... I didn't even have 50,000 subscribers. It was lower than that. It was like probably 25,000. My videos only got a couple thousand views at most. And, uh monetization wasn't really much of anything. So, I didn't have many resources, especially financially, at my disposal. When I first started broadcasting my show, therefore, you know, you can't just all of a sudden expect to be able to get on the best stations, the high-power transmitters, etc. You could only do what's within your means. And one station that a lot of folks start out on, and you still get this to an extent, is a station up in Maine called WBCQ. Alright, and I'm back. I'm sorry about that delay, by the way. It's not, not really a delay. It feels like one on my end. It's just a cut. And obviously I'm not outside anymore, because you can tell by the sound. Uh, reason being, I was a little distracted at first, because I was looking and I saw something in the shadows. And, sure enough, it was a rather large spider, and, uh, normally I don't care, but given the proximity, sometimes I'll abide by a phrase, F around and find out, and, uh, I would say that 
that spider was by definition effing around. So uh, it's dead now. It most definitely is. But, uh, I don't know, it was creeping toward me and I didn't like that, so. There's other, you know, it ha there's better things to do in the world than to do that. It could have been out there eating insects and instead it was, it was like it was menacing. So I shook my head, no, not, not a chance, I'm not going to tolerate that, so. That was that, but when I have to do these things, I always make sure they meet a quick end. I don't want to see them suffer. But if they gotta go, they gotta go. So anyway, um, back to what I was saying, because it was a bit of a, a bit of a disruption there. So, like, with the shortwave, it's all hierarchical. And there's a couple different stations. The cheapest one in the country is WBCQ. Again, they're over in Monticello, Maine. And um, for a while they had a reputation as the independent station. They're run by a former pirate radio guy. They don't have really professional transmitters. It's like old stuff from the 40s that's kind of refurbished by some ham radio guys. In short, they're a budget operation. And all their transmitters at the time operated at 50 kilowatts. And, uh, licensed by the FCC, that's the lowest power you can uh, get on shortwave. And they would sell the airtime on one frequency, it was like 50 to $60 an hour. But on another frequency, they had a special deal where it was cheaper. It was like 20 bucks an hour. And I first started out with that. So obviously the frequency, you know, in the, the, the transmitter, you get what you pay for. But it was a start. It was the first time I was ever able to get on the air. And uh, it was really nice. It was, uh, it was just a great experience that I'll never forget. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because at the time, in 2015, this was 50 kilowatts on a frequency with limited coverage, mostly just for some listeners in parts of eastern North America, and that's about it, on a weeknight from 11 p.m. to midnight. So, it wasn't necessarily the, the most ideal time, but it's, uh, it's what, what was there. And this is why I think that there are times when I think that the listenership in North America has to have declined. Because going through my email, I was looking back at some old reports from 2015 that I would get from listeners... And some of those broadcasts, back then, again, at an unconventional time, a lower power transmitter, a frequency that didn't have the best coverage, get more feedback than some rebroadcasts that I have in 2022 that air at twice the power. The coverage area is probably 10 times bigger. The signal strength and quality is 20 times better. And they'll get fewer emails than what that setup originally in 2015 would get. So that tells me that there's fewer listeners around in general. Um, if you vastly upgrade everything, and everything should tell you that you should be getting more listeners, and it's actually less in some cases, then it tells me the medium is still in decline. And uh, I think that's just the way that it's going. Now, I have my regular broadcasts that I promote, and it kind of, you know, they attract whatever listeners are around. And, you know, I still hear from enough people that it makes the expense still justifiable. So what I'm trying to say is that the medium is in decline. It still is declining, but it's not totally dead. 
And I've heard people in some shortwave groups that are even more pessimistic than I am, and I consider myself a pessimist, but they'll go as far as to say that there's only, um, oh, let's say, I've heard people say that there's only 500 shortwave listeners in North America. And I think that's just taking pessimism to a ridiculous extent, where it's just not realistic. But they'll adamantly defend it. They'll say, oh, no, I, you know, they'll try to, they say, I have the proof to back it up, yet they never give the proof. So I don't buy that for a second. I really don't know how many listeners there are. I mean, I estimate that it's definitely in the tens of thousands regularly, and in the hundreds of thousands intermittently um, in North America to shortwave still. But it's definitely down from the millions that there were even in the 90s. You know, just as an example there, it's like the BBC did audience research in 2001, and they determined they still had a million shortwave listeners in the United States. So, I mean, it's really declined considerably since then. But, heck, I'll use my own figures. I'll give you almost an exact figure. It's like, since I've been doing my shortwave broadcast, I've gotten about 100,000 reception reports from shortwave listeners. Now, yes, that is including listeners in Europe and Asia and South America and North America. However... The bulk of my broadcasts over the years have been targeting North America. So that's where a high percentage of those emails comes from. So that right there should completely invalidate and disprove um, any of those claims that there's only 500 listeners in North America. But like I was saying, I still think the medium is in decline. Now, this year with all the Ukraine stuff going on, there have been some signs that maybe there's a little bit of life still in the shortwave. Um, But even so, and like I said, now this is the pessimist in me coming back, I don't think the, whatever you want to call it, revitalization of the media, uh, the medium, after what's been going on in Ukraine, is really as big as what people thought. Um, that's just my take. Because, sure, after the war in Ukraine began, all right, a number of stations have gone back on the air. The BBC increased broadcasts to Eastern Europe. We've got that. Okay, that's a major broadcaster. Radio Austria International increased broadcasts to Eastern Europe. Vatican Radio did. Radio Taiwan International did. Radio Exterior de España did. Radio Romania International did. A few independent news stations came to be, such as the Echo of Stockholm and Radio Truth for Russia. I'm not going to comment on whether or not the broadcasts, you know, are what... I, I don't know. I don't speak Russian, so I can't tell you if what they're saying is biased or not. But, um, anyway, they're on the air. And then thanks to the fund drive, you've got Radio Free Europe back on the air as well. So there's definitely an increase in broadcasts. At the same time, though, I noticed that some stations, like DW, Deutsche Welle, have not increased broadcasts to the region at all. And Radio France International initially expressed interest in broadcasting to Eastern Europe, but it looks like those plans have fallen through because nothing has ever come from this. And I don't see why, if they haven't done it by now, 
it would at this point. And likewise, you know, the United States, they, uh, the only reason Radio Free Europe is on the air is because the media is public domain, and the U.S. government refused to put it on the air, so people did a fund drive, bought the airtime themselves, and then again, because the media is uh, public domain, they put it on the air themselves. Which kind of says something, you know, if you agree with, you know, the U.S. and the Western point of view with all of it, it's still, you know, you're going to give them $40 billion, but you can't even spare 50 grand to restore the radio services to the region. It's just, you know, uh, forget it. I don't want to talk about the money. I talked about it in the radio show. I'm not going to go there. Forget it. And then otherwise, you know, in other parts of the world, it's like, all right, you see Radio New Zealand, um, they're still going. They've actually, their government has put the, um, has actually allocated some money to buy them a new transmitter. So that's actually a nice development because uh, that kind of tells me that New Zealand, if they're buying a new transmitter for their station, then that tells me that they don't intend to uh, pull the plug on their broadcasts anytime soon because you're not just going to spend all this money, you know, what might be more than a million dollars, you know, on something that you're just going to get rid of in a year or two. So if they're buying a new transmitter, then it tells me that they're going to keep broadcasting to the Pacific for a while. And that makes sense, given how some of the Pacific Islands are. Like you saw what happened with Tonga earlier in the year, how it was devastated by the volcanic eruption. And then you also just look at the state of infrastructure, say, in Papua New Guinea, and uh, some other islands, you know, Vanuatu... Uh, the Solomon Islands, etc., where a shortwave is just still utilized. So it's good to see that Radio New Zealand is uh, still eager to serve the Pacific. Now, you've also seen... Honestly, like I said, this is just a pessimism... Because I see so much BS these days. You gotta realize by now that a lot of politicians will just say whatever they think they can say if it's gonna help them win votes. And once they get into office, and you see this on all sides, what, what happens to those campaign promises, right? Right out the door they go. Either they get bought by someone or they've been controlled by some, or whatever. You know, they pretend to be this, that, and the other thing on the campaign trail just to get your votes, but then as soon as they get into that position, they just become something else. And that's what they've always been, but, you know, they were just kind of putting on an act. So the thing with politicians, mind you, is look at what they actually do in office and if they could actually get stuff done. And if they actually deliver on their campaign promises, then that tells you something about those individuals, because they're a rare breed these days. So, over in Australia, you had the Labour Party, which keeps going on and on about how they're going to restore Radio Australia to the Pacific. And I just kind of shake my head at this, like, some people were saying, oh, I bet you'd be really happy about this news. Nah, I, I don't know. It's just is what it is. I think it's, honestly, let them. I think it's futile at this point. I think it's a waste. Shouldn't even bother at this point. And I'll tell you why. You might say, that's really negative of you to say that, because, I mean, if Radio New Zealand is getting a new transmitter, then it clearly says that there's some interest in the medium still in the Pacific. That's true. That's true. But I'll tell you something that I've observed with other stations. And this just goes for a lot of media 
in general. Sometimes it's not the case, but other times it is. If you leave something, if you leave a platform, and you had a good long run and a built-up following, and you just suddenly drop off, and then years and years later you come back, usually the following you come back with isn't going to match what you originally had. Now, sometimes that isn't the case, but a lot of the time it is. What I've seen with other international broadcasters, if you leave shortwave, and you had an established schedule and frequencies, and you've been broadcasting for years and years, and you just suddenly drop off, and then maybe after a period of time you come back, you will have lost a large percentage of your audience, the medium's declining, it might just give listeners who are already thinking about dropping shortwave a reason to just put their radios on the shelf and not listen anymore. Or they'll move on to other stations. And I'll give an example, a recent example. All India Radio was once a very prolific broadcaster on the shortwave. You know, just a very, very influential broadcaster decades ago, very high listenership, and uh, up until 2020, they maintained a lot of broadcasts on the shortwave, and uh, India was one of those countries that was still very active in the medium. They had high power, 500 kilowatt transmitters uh, out of multiple sites across India, and they broadcast in many languages. They had very expansive and uh, diverse English service to all continents, and I would be able to pick them up in the late afternoons uh, in North America. I think the best frequencies, I still remember it, I would listen to them in the afternoon at around 5 p.m. on uh, 94.45 kilohertz, and they would come through loud and clear, and I would sit outside back in, like, 2014, and uh, listen to All India Radio's English service each day. And uh, it was just interesting programming. Well, in 2020, uh, COVID came along. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, so what? I mean, this is a radio station we're talking about. So what difference does it make? It's like, obviously, radio stations still stayed on the air during COVID. You just had people do the work remotely, you know? You had the programs and all that get assembled just at home. You had someone just kind of sitting there like I am right now with a microphone. They'll do their segments and uh, work remotely. It's what they would all do back, especially early on with COVID. And in terms of the transmitting site, usually that stuff can just be maintained by one or two people. You just got to check the transmitters and it'll be all right. So what's the big deal? I don't know. I guess shortwave transmitters in India do get sick from COVID because they decided early on that we are going off the air because of COVID. Does that make any sense to you whatsoever? They've been on the air for decades, but because of COVID, we're going to shut down broadcasts. Try, try explaining that. Because honestly, I can't. It's one of the stupidest moves that I've seen from a radio station. Either way, though, they did what they did, and they left the airwaves. So, what's going to happen to their audience if they just pull the plug like that and don't even announce it? They just shut everything down one day. They're not going to listen anymore. So finally, in probably early 2021, they started returning broadcasts to the shortwave, even after just a year of disruption. And guess what? What happened to their audience? It's all gone. So resuming the broadcast was a total flop. And after doing that, and after how unsuccessful trying to return to the medium wound up being, they essentially just threw in the towel, 
shut down most of their transmitting sites, and now they only have about a dozen broadcasts a day. They dropped the English service. They don't even target Europe or North America anymore. And uh, they used to have like a hundred something broadcasts each day, and now it's just down to like 12 or 10. That's what happens when you leave the medium for a while and just leave it. The listeners, they don't necessarily come back. You know, once it's gone, it's gone. And they really, they learned that the hard way by doing something really stupid early on. So, that's why I'm skeptical about Radio Australia coming back. Number one, I'm just skeptical that it's a campaign promise. All right, sure, Labour, they won in Australia. I don't think it's coming back, quite frankly. I think that's just something that they said, and uh, that's going to be that. Either way, though, even if it does come back, who is going to be listening at this point? I will tell you this right now. Anyone that used to listen to Radio Australia that depended on it in the Pacific is doing one of three things at this point. They either aren't listening to the radio anymore, or they're listening to the other stations in the region, Radio New Zealand, China Radio International, the BBC World Service, Radio Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands Broadcasting Corporation. They're listening to those stations. They're not listening to Radio Australia. So even if Radio Australia comes back onto the airwaves, they will get a couple listeners back. I could guarantee you that. But if Radio Australia comes back onto shortwave, they are only going to have a fraction of their audience. It's like, let's say, back in 2017, I'll just give an estimate. Let's say that in the Pacific, they had 350,000 listeners. And now out of those 350,000 listeners, now if we just kind of do some... And this is all just guesstimates, let's say. In 2022, I'd say that maybe we would have about eh, 250,000 of them still listen to shortwave at that to- at this point, just as things have changed in the uh, the region. But I think shortwave still is hanging on there, so they're not all gone. They're not all not listening to the radio anymore, but certainly about a third of them aren't. Of those 250,000, though, you know, you'd break it down. I'd say about 70% of them probably listen to Radio New Zealand, and then the rest listen to the other stations. But it's just like, so if Radio Australia comes back out of those 250,000 listeners that might used to have uh, tuned into them, a couple are going to return, but they're not going to get all 250,000 back. Some of them might realize, ah, actually, I like the way Radio New Zealand does things. Or they might say, ah, I like China Radio International's programming better. I like their perspective. You're going to get people who have animosity toward Radio Australia because they'll feel like they got abandoned by them and they'll say, ah, they're back, ah, F them. You know, they screwed me over back in 2017. Why do, why do they deserve my listenership at this point? And, uh... You know, so this is the way it's going to be. So out of that block of listeners, they're maybe going to get about 40,000 of them, but it's going to be nowhere near the hundreds of thousands that they had back in 2017. That's just the way that this sort of stuff works. They're going to have an audience for sure, but it's just not going to be the mass audience that they used to have. The other reason I'm still skeptical is Labour can say whatever they want, With what resources? What resources are you going to use to get Radio Australia back on the airwaves? I mean, just tell me that. I don't really think this is thought through. I don't even think they realize that the transmitting station that broadcast them in 2017 is gutted. They sold the property. It's going to be ranch uh, land, I think, pretty soon. So the main transmitting facility that they used ceases to exist. And I highly, 
highly doubt that they're just going to shovel in tens of millions of dollars at this point to uh, build an entirely new station with dozens of antennas and 100 kilowatt transmitters. I mean, all the infrastructure is gone. The domestic infrastructure is gone. The international infrastructure is gone. So all they're left with now is essentially they're going to have to say, okay, we can either build new transmitting sites, which I'll tell you this right now, that's not going to happen. Or we're going to have to buy the airtime from a third party. And those uh, those options are getting fewer and fewer. They would be best, their best shot then would be going to the BBC, um, who have a transmitting site in Singapore, and saying, look, do you have any antennas and uh, transmitters that we can use to get to the Pacific? And they pro- they might, they still might, but they'll bet they'll say, look, we're going to name the price. And if you want to be on the air so badly, you're just going to have to pay what we tell you. And if they go that route, especially for a reduced audience, they're going to be losing money. So, it's just not as easy as I think they make it sound. It's one thing to say, all right, we're going to restore shortwave. That sounds good. I support that. But when you actually look realistically at the situation, you think to yourself, huh? Is it, is it as easy as they're making it out to seem? You'd think it would just, and I think some of them actually think this, that everything is still there like it was in 2017, and it's just, all right, all we need is just a million bucks, and uh, we'll get the equipment that's still there, just maybe a little refurbished, it's going to be good, we'll rehire the guys that used to work at the site, and uh, we'll just plug the program feeds back into the transmitters, flip the switches, we got money to cover the electric bill, and it's all going to be good. But when the infrastructure is totally gone, that complicates it to a whole new level, even forgetting about the audience situation. So, it just makes you think. Now, anyway, I went on a whole story, and this isn't even what I wanted to talk about. Well, like I said, this is the place for tangents and long-winded diatribes about things most people don't care about. But anyway, mediums in decline. And in 2017, I had a streak of luck. I realized it was luck. Now, I didn't realize it at the time. Where I had some good deals with airtime. And back in 2017, I was able to, for a time, broadcast from a shortwave station in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, across Asia, uh, for listeners in Japan. And that was great. It went over really well, hearing from all sorts of... I mean, that broadcast definitely had high listenership. It was very well received. Unfortunately, the costs were just too high, and I had to drop that after a couple months. Then another opportunity came along. A station in Bulgaria said, Hey, we've got a 150-kilowatt transmitter. We could beam you from Bulgaria toward the UK, and uh, we'll give you a reduced rate. Sign me up, I said. And that lasted a bit longer. That lasted from June of 2017 to uh, around the new year, early 2018. But I dropped that too. And then after that, I struggled with getting any high-power station in Europe. Just the opportunities weren't there anymore. So, in 2019, I started broadcasting... Well, in 2018, I started broadcasting to Europe uh, through 100-kilowatt transmitters in the United States. But the signals, by the time they would traverse all the distance from, especially Florida, to Europe, it was just too weak for most radios, and they never got a substantial following over there at all. Then I started broadcasting in 2019, in 2020, and even 2021, 
with uh, low power, 10 kilowatts, from transmitters in Germany. But the 10 kilowatts, despite being located in continental Europe, just wasn't enough. And the signal was just too weak for most listeners. The only way I can reach an audience in Europe successfully is with a high-power transmitter in the continent itself. And the opportunities were few and far between. But that's why, because I also feel that time is of the essence, I thought if I want to even do this and even have a chance of reaching an audience, may as well do it while there still is an audience. So I decided to make the investment and I went all out with this one. And I bought the airtime, which is quite expensive, from a transmitter 100 kilowatts uh, in Musbrunn, Austria. Like I said, it's professional grade. This is the stuff that the VOA and the BBC and Radio Austria use. And I've got the signal beamed over toward uh, Russia, but it reaches the rest of Europe fine. It reaches the Middle East. It reaches Central Asia, East Asia, South Asia, etc. But because this is a serious undertaking... The first time in five years I've been able to broadcast with high power to Europe. So that's another reason why I'm doing these on YouTube now, to uh, promote that broadcast. Because I'm going to make sure any potential listeners I can reach are going to know about it, and then can tune in. And so far, I'll tell you this right now, the promotion efforts have worked, I feel. And I'm proud to say that I do feel like I'm getting what I paid for. And this is by far the most successful regular broadcast I've ever done to Europe in terms of signal strength, audio quality, and listener response. Nothing else even comes close uh, in terms of reaching listeners to Europe. But in this day and age, like I was saying, this is all that works. If you want to reach an audience in Europe... You have to use high power. You just have to. It's not going to work otherwise. And these days, those options are not cheap. But it does work. You will have people listening. So, that's a very long story. It's something that I probably could have covered in a sentence, but I just wanted to talk about it, so there you have it. And now for the remainder of the broadcast, we are going to be going into the mailbag portion of the show. The way this works is very simple. It is free form. All that I'll be doing is reading and responding to listener emails. If there is a question you have for me, if there is a topic that you would like to discuss with me and voice your thoughts regarding... Or if it is a topic you'd like to hear my thoughts on, you are welcome to share them. If there's anything random you'd like to share, any random anecdotes, if there's something interesting you saw, an experience you had, any thoughts you'd just like to add or interject about the show, about anything, honestly. If you if you saw a Bigfoot and you want to talk about that, I'll read it. If you ate a hot dog today and you want to tell me about that, I'll read that too. So it could be anything. And if you're kind of a little a little lost, then just listen to the next segment, and I think you'll get a good idea of what it is. Way to reach me is simple, via email, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. That's v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. All right, so we're going to begin the mailbag program right now. Now, admittedly, and I I think I say this at least to some extent in every program that I do, but I don't know, I just like saying it, that this portion of the program is being recorded separately and independently from the rest of the the program. It's actually kind of funny how this is uh, kind of playing out. I'm a bit hungry, but... 
I haven't eaten anything yet. So I decided to get a pizza delivered, and uh, while the pizza is being made and all of that, I said, you know what, I'm going to set up the microphone and I'm going to do some um, recording work. So that's exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to be here reading some emails until my pizza gets here. And right now they're giving it about 30 minutes. So we will see. But I'll be here otherwise and um, we'll get some emails read and responded to. So that said... Let's start going through the inbox, and let's see what we have. First email comes in from Filippo in northern Italy. Said, I just listened to the announcement of the new European broadcast. Living in northern Italy, I guess I'll be able to get the best signal for the broadcast with my shortwave radio, a Reticus V117. And, uh, thank you, Filippo, over there in uh, Italy. Absolutely. I mean, I know that radio, it is what it is, um, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not the most sensitive radio in the world. So there are many cases where especially some of the weaker or lower power signals, the radio won't be able to pick up. But this one, I think you'll, you'll definitely get uh, some good reception there in... Uh, in that radio, so thank you for writing in. Uh, we also hear from AG, also in northern Italy, uh, said, I'll be listening in to the broadcast on Fridays. Very exciting, and it'll probably solve the reception problem, so thank you. Looks like we've got some listeners in Italy eager to uh, tune in, which is great to see. It's very good news. Continuing through the inbox... We hear from Trey, who writes in. My name is Trey. I remember watching one of your videos where you mentioned the pocket watch you carry. I've looked for it since, but unfortunately can't find the video. I've carried pocket watches since I was a kid, and currently carry a Double Hunter Skeleton Dial Mechanical Pocket Watch by Charles Hubert Paris. What kind do you carry? So thank you, Trey. Now, I'll be honest with you. Your knowledge of pocket watches far, far, far exceeds anything um, that I have. I, I don't have the pocket watch in front of me, actually, um, because when I initially traveled, I went through an airport and I didn't want to deal with the TSA and that, so I left it behind. So, uh, I'm not sure. It's it's not a very expensive one. It was given to me as a gift, um, which I've always valued. And I just know that time-wise, it has Roman numerals. And I, I always liked that. But... Those are all the details I can provide you. Unfortunately, I haven't it in front of me, so I can't be any more descriptive. But even if I did have it in front of me, I know that I would still just... It, it would sound like I wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So there's nothing really that I can say in that regard. Uh, but thank you for your question. Continuing... We hear from... Well, this is just a generalized question, and some other people might be wondering this, too. It's a listener from southern Russia, uh, close to the Kazakhstan border, and I uh, was looking for an antenna recommendation. Uh, so thank you for your question there. So, I'm going to give a few... specific recommendations. When you have a radio, there's a few things you can do with it to optimize reception. Number one, one of the best things you can do is obviously if you have the built-in 
antenna, I always call it the telescopic antenna, you know, because you could fold it and you could extend it. Number one, make sure that that antenna is extended as far as it'll possibly go. Secondly, sometimes you'll see a little switch on the side of the radio. Now, not every radio is like this, but some are. And it's always worth just looking at the side of the radio and see if there's a little switch on it that says something like gain or A-N-T gain or sensitivity. And what you want to do is make sure that that switch is flipped to the highest gain, the most sensitive, there might be a little setting called DX. Make sure it is hit to that, because what that does is it adjusts the sensitivity of your radio. So that's the first thing. You gotta have the antenna extended, and you gotta have the gain, if you can control it, have that turned up. We don't want it at low, we don't want it at normal, we don't want it at local. So that's another thing to just take into account. Third tip to optimize radio reception. Sometimes electronic devices can mess with the, uh, the reception. They could cause interference. So one thing that you need to do, especially what I have seen is that various chargers uh, can have detrimental effects on reception. They cause a lot of static, they cause a lot of interference. So if you're charging your phone and you could unplug the charger, do it. If you're charging your laptop and you could unplug the charger, do it. Because those things generate a lot of static and will further impede reception. So unplug those chargers. Then the final thing to do is to get a wire antenna. Now, a lot of these are compa uh, compatible with many radios, but I would recommend getting a wire antenna such as the Sanjian ANT60, and I'll spell that out for you. That's S-A-N-G-E-A-N, so Sanjian ANT-60, Sanjian ANT-60, or another good antenna is the CC shortwave real antenna. And how these wire antennas work, because I think when you think of a radio antenna, again, you think of like this metal thing. And when you get a wire antenna, it's just a thin black wire. And you think, how is this going to make reception any better? This doesn't look like an antenna. But believe me, it can make a massive difference, but it needs to be done the right way. The best way to use a wire antenna is when you think of it this way. How a wire antenna works is it's usually a 20 to 30 foot long wire. That's it. But through a little component, what it essentially does is it transforms that little string of wire into the radio's antenna. So when you think of it that way, when it's hooked up to your radio, instead of your radio just having the metal antenna that's maybe a foot or two long, now you've got a 30 foot long antenna. So the longer the antenna is, obviously the better the reception is going to be. So that's how it works. It's just taking the string of wire and it's essentially turning it into your antenna. And again, now you've got 30 feet worth of antenna to deal with, and that's gonna make the reception a whole lot better. But the thing you have to understand with wire antennas, the placement of it is critical. And here's what I mean by that. If you're just setting up the wire antenna indoors, it's going to be a waste of time. Because all you're doing then is having this big antenna that's probably just going to pick up the indoor interference better. The way to optimize a wire antenna is feed it outside. So if you're near a window or something to that extent, 
what you want to do is you want to take one end of the antenna, the wire, and it usually has a little clip, a little what they call an alligator clip. And if you're in a house or anything, take it out the window and guide that thing as far away from the house as it'll go. If you could clip it to a tree branch, it'd do it. If you could clip it to a, uh, to anything, a plant, a little, uh, anything in your yard. If you want to just bring it out onto the deck and wrap it around one of the posts or something. But what you want to do is you want to have the wire antenna leading out of the house. You want the antenna going into an area away from interference. So what I'll often do is I'll feed the antenna out the window and hook it onto just something nearby. But when you do that, and if it's done correctly, and again, I know that that's not always possible, especially if you live in an apartment, etc. But if you have the space and the property to be able to do that, you're going to notice reception is going to be exponentially better. But you do what you can. Um, but a wire antenna, again, if it's fed outside, you could still have your radio indoors. There's a little port you could usually just plug the antenna into. Um, it's going to make a world of difference in regards to uh, to reception. So there's that. And finally, one of the best things to do is to just take into account the frequencies and times that reach you best. So obviously, taking all that into account, you know, you want to listen to the Friday broadcast on 9670 kilohertz, right, at the time of 7 p.m. Moscow Standard Time, or 8 p.m. Samara Time. And that's going to be the frequency that you could, you could pick the show up on. Sometimes there's going to be frequencies that just aren't going to reach you. It's like if you're at the Kazakhstan border and you're trying to pick up let's say, a frequency of mine to, that's beamed over to Mexico, odds are you could do everything that I just said, and you're just not going to be able to pick it up, and that's just how it is. But taking those tips into account, and this isn't just for the one listener, this is for everyone uh, experiencing reception issues, please take that into account. And uh, these can make a huge, huge difference. So thank you for writing in and for your question. Again, like we have a, a response coming in from Ryan in Los Angeles. And he was mentioning the same thing with reception. So just take that into account, Ryan, what I was just saying um, to the other listener. And just remember the frequency you want is 5850 kilohertz at 7 p.m. Pacific every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening. But the same advice applies in your circumstance. What's this? Troy says you're in a Korean pop video. Not a music video, just a live TV show. Well, let's see what this is. Let's get the sound going here. You gave a timestamp. What is this called? Dreamcatcher X Alcohol. I have no idea what that is, but all right. So what is this? Now I find that a bit absurd, but there you have it. So thank you, Troy. I guess they were 
trying out different alcoholic beverages, and I guess they weren't a fan of that or something. Dreamcatcher. What is that? I guess that's the name of like a, maybe a K-pop group or something, because I don't know who any of the folks in the video are. K-pop just isn't my thing. Well, thanks, Troy, for sending that in anyway. Yeah, the whole disappointment thing that's thrown in for a whole, a whole lot of things. It's funny how that is. All right, what else do we have? Mark in Northern California. Did not know you don't like going out. I can sympathize. And I, too, sometimes get overwhelmed with stimulation on my senses. I know hiking in the mountains and getting away from the noise of the city does me well. Uh, take care, and you have many fans out there who appreciate what you do. Thank you, Mark. Northern California. Alex sends in a short email. You mentioned being a happy recluse. Some of us are creatures of the indoors, and it can be a comfortable and fulfilling lifestyle. Amen. To that, Alex, you're spot on. So thanks for writing in. I I concur. I agree. Mac is checking in. You go by the name B81. So just if you know who you are. Um, I'm not going to read your question, but no, no, there is uh, no relation to that. All right, we hear from Brady, who writes, Have you ever listened to Imagine Dragons? If so, what are your thoughts on them? Oh, I've listened to uh, Imagine Dragons. They're, uh, they're all right. Uh, not my favorite band, but they've got some good songs. I first uh, heard of Imagine Dragons, I think, when pretty much everyone else did. Uh, their song... I don't know which one came first. It was either Radioactive or it was, uh, what was their first hit? It's right on the tip of my tongue, too. I'm gonna have to just search on YouTube, Imagine Dragons, and just look at their discography. Because I'm not going to be able to figure this out otherwise. Let's see. Right, there was Radioactive. I know that. But what the hell was their first hit? Unless I'm getting the band mixed up. I mean, that could be. Okay, no, the first, the first song of theirs that I became aware of was It's Time. That's the first Imagine Dragons song that I heard. And I think that's the first Imagine Dragons song a lot of folks did. I shall submit that I, f I like the aesthetic in the music video of It's Time. If you watch it... Oh, it's just awesome. Now, I understand that maybe it's supposed to be like post-apocalyptic and all that sort of stuff, but, uh, wow. It's beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful, just the, the gray and the low clouds. Oh my gosh, this is, uh... Oh, this is amazing. That's, that's just great. So, it's time is the first one that I became aware of. Following that, in 2012, I became aware of Radioactive. Both of those I thought were pretty good songs. Then, 
There were a few more songs. Thunder, a couple years ago, I, that, that got a lot of radio airplay. And, uh, on top of the world as well. So, there's a couple songs of theirs that I definitely like. Um, not one of those groups that I'll necessarily do a deep dive into and just start going through everything. Uh, but they certainly have some prominent hits and uh, some catchy songs, I'd say. Thanks, Brady, for writing in. Uh, this listener writes, Hey, review bra, just wanted to say that the suit in your most recent review, uh, in reference to the uh, Shake Shack review, was absolutely fashionable. Keep being you. You're one of the only YouTubers who stand their ground against the current climate, which is fast, loud, and obnoxious videos. Thanks for the years of entertainment. Well, thank you for your kind words of support. I just like to do things the way that I do. You know, the world and things change, but I just have my way of doing things, and I say, why, why can't I not do it that way? It's not hurting or harming anyone, so I remain steadfast, and it's it's what I like doing, so thank you. Thanks for uh, your kind words. We hear from David in Smithfield, North Carolina. The topic I'd like to run by you is this. I don't go out of my way to do it, but I don't mind killing bugs or plant life if necessary. Beyond that, I abhor killing, or hurting in any way, living creatures. I don't even like seeing animals killed by each other in documentaries, or sushi chefs killing live fish at the time they're recorded. If it were left to me to do the killing and butchering of my own food, I'd become a vegetarian, because I live by a do-no-harm motto, and I appreciate animal life. Having said that, I don't mind eating fish or meat bought at a market or in a restaurant. Guess I'm okay with turning a blind eye to the killing and butchering uh, if I didn't have to do it myself. Which I guess is hypocritical thinking to a degree. I'm sure if I felt strongly enough I'd take a stand and become a vegetarian, but it's not the world we live in. Have you ever thought about this? So thanks, David, in Smithfield, North Carolina. Interesting perspective there. I'm sure that all of you know that I am a meat eater, and I've always taken the position that that's just what I will remain. It's just what uh, works best for me. I understand, though, that the idea, if you had to kill whatever it is that you're eating, it would... uh, cause some issues. No doubt it would. No doubt it would. It would mess with me, too. I just don't think, for me, I would would be able to get to the point where I would be uh, a vegetarian, and that's just the honest answer. You know, I know people listening would like to hear me say otherwise. I think what I would try to do if I had to kill whatever it is I was going to eat, I would do so in the most humane or quick way, you know? If I have to kill something, I wouldn't want it to suffer. I would just want it to be lights out, it doesn't even know what what happened, and that's that. You know, assuming the method of killing would be up to me, I mean, you you know, you could even go with, like, an inert uh, gas and... It'll just peacefully die. Or, you know, something much more, um... Much more out there, but, you know, like... Shooting in the head or some sort of incapacitation of the brain, etc. Just some some sort of way that, if you have to do it, you do it so that the creature has the absolute least amount of suffering uh, possible. And I understand people would say, well, you shouldn't be doing that at all. Now, you know, like I said, people have their point. But if anything, compared to how the animal kingdom is, it would be, it would almost appear saintly in comparison. 
and we know how it is. Whether we want to admit it or not, you see in a lot of the wildlife documentaries, the way some animals kill each other, the predator versus the prey, you know, if a human did that, it would be torture. It would be unimaginably wrong. So compared to a fate that the animal might have suffered in the wild, who knows, it could be a it would be like a mercy killing type of thing. Who's to say? I always liked the uh, saying, because the one thing also is that sometimes if people get hungry enough, all this stuff just goes out the door. I always liked the saying. I don't know where it came from, if it was from a a writer or a, a talk show host or a song or a movie or what, but I always liked the phrase, we're all... We are always nine meals away from anarchy. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, if people start starving to death, like I said, uh, ethics and all of that are going to go right out the window. But no, I get it. I understand it. And I just said to myself, I don't want to sit here and give the cop-out answer that sounds good but is just BS. So... That's just my take. And that's all that I have for you in tonight's program. Thank you for listening. I hope you could tune in again soon. And please remember the new shortwave broadcast for listeners in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. 9670 kilohertz every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern European Summer Time, that's Moscow Standard Time, 6 p.m. Central European Summer Time, 5 p.m. British Summer Time. So I hope I could see you on the airwaves. Thank you for listening. Until next time, be safe, be healthy, and I wish you all the very best. Take care, this is VORW.